If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, while you're turning there, uh, remember always to pray for our missionaries, and sometimes we forget to even mention them, which is kind of a shame to us. And I also will say that um, I love hearing my granddaughter singing this morning. Uh, the Lord has made us a promise uh, that uh, if we uh, if we honor Him, the best way to do it is tell tell our children to the third and fourth generation. And so if we tell them, they're going to learn it. And uh, if not, uh, it says the same thing about sin. Uh, if you have your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll begin reading in verse 18. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, beginning in uh, verse 18, the Bible says, What is my reward then? Verily that, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have, I, yet have I made myself a servant unto all, that I may that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became as I, to the weak became I, I, as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might, might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run a race Run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you might obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. How they do it to obtain, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I, there, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I. Not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Yeah. I'd like to preach, the Lord be my helper, this morning on the thought, run faster. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we Thank you for this group uh, that's faithful to gather together to meet on the Lord's Day and to lift up your name in song and that we might seek from your word what we ought to do. Lord God, we pray that you fill this uh, house this morning with your presence, Lord, that uh, you would call the saved, cause the saved to rejoice in you, what you did for us on Calvary, uh, what the Holy Spirit does for us in encouragement and in drawing. Lord, we pray for the lost this morning that today would be the very day that you'd speak life to them. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, some fairly familiar verses from the gospel, excuse me, from the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, Paul uh, gives us a, a kind of comparison of this present life with running to ministry. Uh, and we'll see that it really extends beyond those that are called to preach the gospel, but it extends to each of one of us and how we're going to follow Christ. Now, the tendency is with mankind, the older that we get, the slower that we move. Now, what we're to do according, you know, when, when I've not seen too many races, and most of the races, foot races I've seen, have been on TV, but seemingly right at the end they get another sprint, and they take off, and that's how they win. Now, that's where we as the Lord's people need to be, 
just running faster and faster toward the prize. Now, as Paul is writing, he wants them to understand some things. He asks, what is my reward then? And, and I ask you, what is your reward? Really, what are you going after? What, what is your desire at the end of this life? Now, uh, first of all, if you're not very cautious, and we'll, we'll see that in a moment, your reward will become what this life has to offer. And you know what? There's a lot of things out there that, that's enticing. There, there's a lot of things out there that are drawing to this flesh and interesting and, and, and you know, uh, very, very captivating when you look at them and you say, man, that house has six bedrooms in it. Wouldn't it be nice to have something like that? Well, you know what? Just because we can don't mean that we should. And, and, and so then we as the Lord's people, we need to be very cautious how, how that we approach the running that we have to do. What is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ, that I may make the gospel without charge. Now, if, if you remember, the Bible says in one place that how Paul met Priscilla and Aquila is they both were of the same trade, which was tent makers. Now, it's fine to have a full-time pastor. It's good if it's possible. But you know what? I want to be able to make a living so I don't have to depend on the church. Now, that may seem a little crash, and that may seem a little holy, but you know what? I want to preach the gospel without being fearful that I'm going to get terminated at the end of the sermon. You see what I'm saying? And that was Paul's thing. He says, I want to preach the gospel, and, he, and, and that was his interest. And you know, some, some of the words that Paul wrote said were very difficult, but he was faithful to them. Then he says, that I abuse not my power in the gospel, verse 19. For, the, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Now, I'll ask you, and you can evaluate this week, who are you a servant to? Now, nobody really likes to take, think about servitude. It, it is slavery. It is taking on their culture. It, it is being a servant. And, and many people, but if we're to reach other cultures, that is going to be what we have to do. And Paul begins to make that very clear in the following verses. And unto the Jews, I became as a Jew. Now, Paul was a Jew. He understood their culture very carefully. And he says, for those folks, I'm a Jew. I, I do what the Jews do. I act the way that the Jews act so that I might gain them unto Christ. Verse 20 to 21. Now notice he's writing to a Greek church, converted Greek people. And he writes to this, to them that are without the law. And they were without the law of Christ. They were without the books of Moses. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, and that I may gain, I'm sorry, to them that are without the law, as without the law, being not without the law to God. Now let me insert this, and if you have a King James Bible, notice that that's in parenthesis. And he, he was saying, they don't know the law, but they're accountable. And you may not understand and know the law, but you're accountable to the law. And then he said, but that I'm but under the law to Christ. He wanted to bring them unto Christ. That I might gain them that are without or that don't know the law. To the weak became I weak. Now, and that's, that's a thing today where men like to strut around like bandy roosters and the bigger the better and what, what they can do and what they can't do. Well, you know what? Sometimes to become, uh, to reach the weak, you have to become weak. You, you, you know, uh, everybody that, uh, uh, y'all know that I love Fanny Crosby songs. You know when she was, that she was really saved? She was deceived for many years and in her 30s, 
She was working in a tuberculosis, uh, a typhoid hospital in New York, Tennessee, uh, in New York, New York, and she contracted typhoid herself and was near unto death and realized that she was without Christ. And you know what? How she got typhoid? By being around with people with typhoid. And you know how you're going to gain people to Christ? By understanding who they are. By, by understanding that the problems that they face every day. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we, we need to understand this missionary attitude that Paul had. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men that, I by, that by all means saved some. Now I want you to see that Paul was certain that not all would be saved. Verse 23, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that I, might, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run a race run all? Now everybody that's in a race takes off and runs. Everybody that's participating has to perform. But, you know, despite in the new day how everybody gets a reward... That doesn't happen in the things of Christ. You know what that's done? That's dumbed down our nation. Well, everybody's a winner. No, not everybody's a winner. There's one winner in a race, and we need to get back to that. You know, the others did fine. The others participated, but they are not the winner. You know, if that's true, if everybody's a winner... You know what's going to happen very soon? That nobody's going to give it their best. Right? Yeah. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we, we need to understand that we need to give it totally everything that we have this, this time here on earth. Give it 110% and give it to Christ. Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that you may obtain. And every man striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now, if you want to be the best, if you want to be the master, you have to be moderate. I think Adam was saying something to this in, in the break between services that, you know, the, the key... The key is, you know, not all things are essentially bad or essentially good. The thing is to be moderate. You know, there's nothing wrong with chocolate cake. But if you eat the whole thing, it's going to make you sick. Right? Be moderate. And be temperate. That, that word means control. And, you know, we live in a day and age where very few people have any control over their flesh. Their flesh rules them and not the other way around. And, and, and so we find then that what ought to be our goal is to increase our control. To know what we, to know that we are temperate. Then he says, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. And again, the Greeks understood this because they literally are the ones uh, that, that had a Colosseum uh, dedicated to uh, things like this. But we an incorruptible. I therefore, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, meaning he knew he was going to get a crown, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep, un, I, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means what I myself would preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, we're not going to get too deep into that portion, but listen, the very best way you can do is to the very best ability that you have, keep this body under subjection and line it up to that book. So we find that what Paul suggests is that we run, that, that we give it all we have. Well, whatever body that we have left, you give it 110%. Go to the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. And, and we're going to read how this begins. Mark chapter 1 and uh, 
Uh, we're going to read just verse 80. Mark 1 in verse 80. I'm sorry, um, uh, Luke chapter 1 in verse 80. Luke chapter 1 and verse 80. The Bible says this, And the child, meaning John the Baptist, and the child grew... And waxed strong in the spirit, and was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. Now, I want you to see, and you all know the story of John the Baptist. He was ordained of God. He was born to a woman who was very, very old. And that made him a miraculous child. And then, uh, as his time of ministry grew near, he was called out into the desert, and he was there for some time, and then came on the scene in his camel and in, in his leather clothes and began to preach, hey, there's one coming. He preached that, and the only other subject that he preached on was repentance. Repent, and there's the Lord Jesus Christ coming. There is the answer to salvation coming. Repent, and this man is coming. Now, I want, what I really want you to see, when we are wanting to run, and we want to be online, and we want to be where we need to be in running this race, it takes some preparation. It, it takes some time. Now, probably nothing else that the Mormon church teaches or preaches would I ever agree with, but their young men take two years and give it nothing else but to their cause. Not a bad idea, is it? They are not married yet. They're on their own. And I know you've all seen them in their little bicycles. And they have their little black ties. And their black britches. And white shirts. And they, you know, they're all very neat and trendy. And they go around giving out tracts. And trying to give out their Book of Mormon. And again, I understand that it's trash. And, that is, and I'm, not, I'm not hesitant to say that. It's full of lies. But, you know what that is? It's very similar to what John did. Just get away by yourself and give some time with the Lord. So if you want to walk well, and I want to walk well, you know what it's going to take sometimes? Getting away from everybody else and focusing on what God has for us. And that's exactly what John did. Did. And no doubt John even knew what the end result of his ministry was going to be. And that's when his head cut off by, by, the Roman, uh, by the Roman authority. But still, now he still ran. Now if you knew that the end of the race wasn't glorious. If you knew the end of the race, what it really was going to be is your head cut off right here. Would you run quickly to that end? That's exactly what we're supposed to do. Just everything that you got. Run, run, run. And, and so we as the Lord's people in, in the modern day, I don't know that we do this, but listen, if you want to do this, if this is something that you want to really get involved with, take some time to, your, to yourself and certainly do it. Now go to the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in the first verse. Mark 1, in the first verse, the Bible says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before my face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare you the way of the prepare, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached bapti the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, I want to inject here that, that the, God, the thing that John preached was this, uh, the baptism of repentance. 
Now, if you want to really get a marvelous study going, you know, um, and I understand we're good Baptist people, and we understand there's no power in baptism. But, you know, there's a lot more than baptismal water in that book. The Bible says, be baptized in the Holy Ghost. That, 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 that means being very just immersed in the person of God that's here on earth right now. You know what? The Lord Jesus Christ is not here. God Jehovah is not here. The Holy Ghost is the one that's here. And we should be immersed in that person because he's the only person that's here. And, and, and so John's repentance, he said he, his baptism was a baptism of repentance. So he wanted his people to be genuinely repentant of what they were. Verse 5. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized him baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with the girdle of a, of a skin about his loin, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. Now, I'll tell you a couple of other things about John. Again, he had this he had this time of isolation out in the desert, and when he came back, he looked different. Now, you know, can you imagine just having a pair of camel skin about you? You know what? That would look very strange, would it not? It looked strange in that day, and it would look even stranger today. You know what? They had cloth, remember? Lydia, the uh, seller of purple, that was purple cloth. It was expensive tapestry. And he shows up, the very one selected by God, in, in dried skins. And what he ate was very, very different. Locust. That's a big grasshopper. And I can say I've eaten one. Mexico, and I don't know why boys say it or not. I think Matthew ate one. Uh, I know Adam refused it. Uh, smart. Uh, they, they are not pleasant. Uh, they do not taste good. But you know what? As my mom always says, it fills an empty spot. And that's what his diet was. That's what he ate, and honey. Now, I'd have to say, if I was John the Baptist, I would have dipped the grasshopper in the honey and did it that way. Because it made it a little bit more palatable. But see, for, for the believer, our diet should be different. And I don't mean what we're fixing to receive downstairs. That book is our diet. And if we are to run the race, you've got to get in that book. Because what does the runner do if he's not filled up? If, if, he's not, if he's not nourished before the race, he's going to play out. He's going to run out of energy somewhere along the way. And, and then so we as the Lord's people, we've got to understand that what our diet ought to be. And we don't need to em be embarrassed if we, look, if we look different, if we act different. Now... We are going to talk about Paul the, uh, next, and I'm going to kind of skip Paul. Uh, well, go with me to Acts chapter 9 very quickly, and we're going to talk about some things that, that uh, happened in the life of Paul. Acts chapter 9, uh, and we're going to begin reading in verse 20. Now, I want you to see this is just following the conversion of Paul. Right after he was saved, you know, all know the story, on the road to Damascus, he was struck down. You know what? If you've never been struck right in the face with your sinful nature, you're probably still lost. See, when you behold your own nature, it will leave you flat of your back. And, and, and if that's never occurred, you've probably never been redeemed because you know what? We think we're pretty good, don't we? We think we're a very nice people, and I ain't done that bad. I've never done this. I've never done bad. But the Bible says this. You came forth from the womb speaking lies. 
And so we're born with a sinful nature. And if we're not, if we're not relieved by God from that sinful nature, you know what? We'll remain in it to the days of our death. And, and, and so Paul had had this experience. Uh, the Lord had saved him on the road of Damascus. And you can read that this week. He wasn't seeking God. He wasn't looking for Christ. But Christ showed up and saved him. Uh, just a few chapters over in, in uh, Acts ch uh, chapter 16. You know what? Lydia wasn't looking for Christ, was she? But she found him. Yeah. Or I'll say this. He found her. Right. And, 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 and so we, we see then that Paul had had this conversion experience. And I want you to notice in verse 20. And straightway, that means after he received his sight back. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So right after his conversion, the one they had used to use to go round up Christians and throw them into prison, he went right in the center of the Jewish house and said, Listen, you've missed the boat. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one you put to death, is the very Son of the living God, Jehovah. And immediately he began to work. Now that, that is what we need to do. You know what? That, now, uh, Jared is working out now. And, and, and that, that was just, you know, I said the other week, I didn't know if I'd get 50 pounds up. And uh, I think one of my kids pointed out that I could leave a sack of feet, so I guess I, I could do that much. But, uh, Jarrett, you didn't start out with that 225, did you? See, uh, and he didn't, st he didn't start out on the shipwreck, did he? It, it, it takes time to build that. He started going around people he knew, people he understood, the Jews, and said, listen, there's a man named Jesus. You missed it. You, you weren't on point. I wasn't on point. We missed the Lord Jesus Christ. And he began to preach to them, and that's exactly what God's people are to do. Verse, uh, verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on the name which called on this name in Jerusalem and, and came hither for the for that intent that he might bring them bound into the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength. Now I want you to be this could be your question to yourself this morning. What does exercise end in? It increases an increase of strength. It ends in an increase of ability. And, and so if we're exercising ourselves, if you're exercising yourself in this book, you know what? Pretty soon you're going to be very familiar with it. Pretty soon you're going to be able to flip through the pages and find things uh, very quickly. Oh yeah, I've read that before. And you're going to be able to flip through it. See, very quickly he increased in strength. He was no longer shy, but rather bold uh, uh, about preaching of the things of God. You know, uh, I don't remember my first sermon that well. I just remember it was at the Bumpus Mills Church and my, some of my people were there. Uh, Judy and Mama came, and uh, I'm sure it was very mild to how I preached today. I really don't remember, but I had to, it had to, uh, over the years you just keep working, keep building, and that's exactly what he did. And uh, so it says he increased in strength and confounded the Jews, which dwelt at. Damascus proving that this is the very Christ. And after that, many days, and after that, many days were fulfilled, and the Jews took counsel to kill him. Now I want you to see this many days. Don't give up. Because some days you're not going to feel like doing it. Some days you're not going to feel like running. When I used to was walking, there were some days it was cool and it was raining and I just didn't want to go. But if you're disciplined, you'll go anyway. 
And that's exactly what Paul did. And, and it, it caused him to increase in the things of God. And it was to the point the Jews were sick of him. You know what? Uh, if, if the world becomes sick of you and, and, and your numbers go down a little bit, don't be discouraged because you know what? That's what happened to Paul. They were sick of hearing it. They no longer wanted a part of this name Paul and they, this man named Paul, and they certainly didn't want to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, their approach, let's shut him up. But, uh, and after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying awake was known of Saul, who is Paul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Now, I want you to see, he's gone from mildly preaching in the temple, and now he was out boldly proclaiming the name of Christ, and the first threat on his life comes. See, sometimes it don't go very well, and, and could you imagine the only way to get out of the city, and I'm assuming he was at Damascus still, and Damascus was a walled city, uh, having stand for the Lord so well that you were having to escape in a basket. You, you know what most of us would have done right here? We would have quit. We would have ran and find a place, safe place to stay after escaping in this way. And, and so, but rather, you know what Paul used it as? Paul saw it as a strengthening. Paul saw it as an increase. Paul looked at it as something better than he had before. Acts 18. Acts 18. Uh, excuse me. Acts 16, verse 18. Acts 16, verse 18. Now, speaking of the woman who was, uh, uh, that was uh, possessed of devils, and this did she, meaning the, de the demon-possessed woman, and then, and this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name uh, of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out, meaning the demon, and he came out the same hour. Now, I want you to see this very same man that humbly began to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is now casting out demons, saying... You come out of her. You know what? He would have never done that without slowly gaining more and more. You know, by this point, he was running really, really good, wasn't he? He, he was no longer slow stepping. He was going. And we, as the Lord's people, if you've been saved uh, 15, 20, 30 years, and you're still slow stepping, you have a real you have a spiritual problem. And, and, and so we find then that they that he did exactly. Uh, it, it was amazing what the Lord was doing in his life. So he, he cast out this devil from this woman. Verse 19. And when her master saw their hope, the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace and to the rulers. And brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, uh, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrate went, uh, uh, the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Now, I want you to see the attitude of the world is never favorable to preaching. The attitude of the world as this great success in Paul's life. He's going faster and faster and running harder in the things of the Lord. You see the world hits him right in the face. And listen, this evening, this morning, if this is your determination and you're serving him more and more and you're interested in the gospel preached word of God, listen, trouble is coming. Now, as long as you're okay with the way it's going right now, listen, kick back in the recliner because you're going to be fine right where you're at. 
But if you mean business with God, trouble go away. And, and we see that as Paul, what well, to me would have been a miraculous thing to observe. And he cast out a demon. He had power over the demon. And, and the demon came out. It would have been a wonderful thing to see. They got upset about it. And when they had laid, verse 23, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast, him into, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep him safe, to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now, I want you to see uh, this praying and singing. I don't think the prayer was, Lord Jesus, please get us out of this place. Please remove these stocks so we can take make a run for it. I believe it's more like, blessed be the name of the Holy God, Jehovah. Blessed be the name of the mighty Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the time that you've given us here. Thank you for all these prisoners that we might share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you for putting us in the right place at the right time. Thank you for this. They weren't upset. And, and then, they began, man, they got so excited over just understanding that. They began to sing and praise God. That's what we need to do. In other words, instead of getting... Um, <laughs> Instead of getting immobilized, he ran faster. He went on and he moved quicker and he moved faster than he did before. And that should be the goal of every one of us that are here this morning. Just, just keep going. Just keep moving. Now, uh, I'll tell you about a danger in the little book of James. And every one of us has been here. The little book of James, chapter 1. James 1 and verse 13. Let no, man, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, evil neither tempteth he any man. Now, what does God do? He tests. He doesn't test because he doesn't know. He tests so you will know. You understand what I'm saying? But he's, he does not tempt. When, when he said, when he said uh, to Peter, uh, <laughs> Before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice. He didn't say, I'm tempting to you. He knew he was going to do it. See, what the testing of Peter was, was he going to deny him or was he not going to deny him? And, and so we as the Lord's people don't, when you mess up when, and you're going to fall flat on your face, you're going, to, you're going to want to get out of church, you're going to want to quit, you're going to see opportunity in other places, you're going to see where the, where the, the goal, you know, where the running's a little bit smoother and somebody don't harp all the time on coming out from among the world and you're going to see better opportunities in other places. You know what? In that, you're going to fall. You'll fall flat on your face. You'll face, you'll face plant sometimes. But when that happens, don't you, don't you blame it on God. Don't you blame it on, on uh, <laughs> that he caused you to sin. Well, it's what the Lord says. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. See, our lust still works, don't it? Our lust still uh, our, our lusts are intact. This flesh still lives. And when lust have conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. So just be aware of your nature. Be aware of who you are. Second Timothy chapter 4. We find that Timothy is in the home stretch. Now, Many times when we get older, we feel like quitting. Uh, I've heard some people, 
And some of you know who I'm talking about. They were old, elderly in years. And they quit coming to church. And I visited one of these women and I said, why don't you return to church? Well, my church has let me down. In other words, people are not coming enough. But you know what? It was funny to me. She could walk up and down these riverbanks and fish but couldn't get to the house of God. That's not finishing well. I don't know if the woman was saved or not. But I do know this. She could run up and down a riverbank but didn't feel like coming to the house of God. You know what? That don't add up. But I'll say this. I haven't been 85 yet. I haven't been 70 yet. You see what I'm saying? At the end of your race, there might be some different things happening. So we see then that w what there must be among human nature is this. As you get into the end, you're moving not only slower physically, you're moving slower spiritually, but you don't have to. Now that, that, that is an option, but you don't have to. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, very familiar verses of scripture. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist. Now this was information, this was suggestions, this was direction to young Timothy from Paul. Does it sound like a quitter? What's the work of an evangelist? This is not an evangelism ministry. This is a pastoral ministry. I pastor New Testament Baptist Church. And on the Lord's day, as instructed by the word of God, we're here to worship him and lift him up and give him glory. So the evangelist work has to be out there, does it not? Do the Timothy. And you know what? Where was Timothy pastoring when this was happening? Anybody know? He was pastoring at Ephesus Church, was he not? And so he says, in addition to you pastoring, you do some evangelism too. Does that sound like somebody who wants to quit? Does that sound like somebody ready to stop and, and throw in the towel and give it up? No, it doesn't sound that way to me. It sounds like at the very end, he was running as fast as he could. Yes, he was in prison. Yes, he was locked up. But he was still using the means. You know, by those very means, we have the book that lays before us today. He was still running. What about you? Where are you at in that? He was still making strides for Christ. But watch thou in all things endure affliction to the work of evangelists. Make full proof of thy ministry. Now, every one of us, you may not be a preacher. Ladies, you have your ministry. Make full proof of your ministry. That means check for leaks. Check for things that are not going right. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. He was finishing the race, wasn't he? And you know what? He was finishing it right. Running, running picking up speed on the last leg. And that's exactly what we need to do, don't we? Yeah. Think about where you're at in your ministry. And again, you're, if you're not a preacher like me and Jared, you still have a ministry. Where are you at in that? What, what do you spend the majority of your time doing? And I have two. One of them is, is something I can't get away with. I can't get away from and the other one I spend too much time doing. The first one is work. 40 hours every week. Can't get away from it as long as I'm feeding these girls and dying. Right? And most of you young men are right there with me. Then I watch way too much TV. There was a time in my life I'd go weeks without watching TV. But I made it available to myself. You see what I'm saying? And... That, that demands time and takes away from the study of the Word of God. And, and if you're not studying the Word of God, you know, some of the best times I used to have in the Lord is just when I was out walking on my place there. Um, that's still running, is it not? Look for things that will slow you down. Look for things that 
that are taking away from the race that you run. Last place this morning, if you look with me in the book of Revelation, chapter number 4, and we're just going to read verse 10 or 8 and 11 for time's sake. Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. And this is the worship scene that God observed in the throne room. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for Thou hast created all things and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. That's the way to finish up, is it not? You know, um, when I think about finishing, I don't know that I'm going to finish that well. Now, I laugh and tease my boys that uh, I'm just as hit as they are. And I know it's not true. Me and Matthew argued several times about being middle-aged. I'm not middle-aged. But, you know, I'm past middle-aged. To be middle-aged right now, I have to live to be 100. I don't think that's going to happen to you. So what have I done, really? How have I... Because you know what? Uh, Y'all remember the song that Donna wrote, uh, Seasons of Our Lives. Oh. Me and Donna are in the fall. Fall is the most beautiful time of the year, is it not? We're there. That means we don't have our best years left, does it? It means our best years are gone. Have we used them? Winter will be coming eventually, won't it? Mm -hmm. And then, the thing about winter, you can't do a whole lot. You're trapped in your house because of the cold. Right. Then we've wasted it all, have we not? Same thing with us. Keep running. Not only keep running, run faster. As your pastor, that's what I'm telling you, run faster tomorrow than you did today. 